Welcome to Beer and Baseball, a Myrtle Beach Pelicans production. I am your host, Adam Dellinger. But before we get to today's pod, here are a few housekeeping notes. First off, this is a new podcast, so the more you share, the more listeners we obtain. Where can you listen, you might ask? On the iHeart Podcast Network and also on the Myrtle Beach Pelicans YouTube channel. Listen, subscribe, review, five stars would be great, and share. That's all we ask. Now, let's go. Last week, my wife is just after me about uh, stopping into Target to get stuff for my daughter's Easter basket. All right. She's my daughter's four. And I'm like, I've taken this. I mean, I'm going to the studio and I'm doing the show every day. I'm the only person in the studio. And then as soon as that's over, I go back home. So I have no human interaction whatsoever. I have it. And I, and I do a morning show, right? So I get gas. It's 430 in the morning. I mean, there's no humans awake, even if we weren't in a full quarantine. I'm not interacting with people. I'm like, I don't want to go to Target. But anyways, I, I, I do this Target pickup, right? The drive up, they bring it out to your car. Location craps on your phone. You don't even have to push any buttons. They knew I was there. Like, honest to goodness, when I pulled in, they knew I was there. So there's an attendant with a bag. He puts it in the trunk, scans the bar th- barcode through the window, taps the trunk and gives me like one of these, like it's a 1955 full service gas station or whatever. So I drive off. But what I realized is as convenient as that was, you can't shop that way. And I mean, shop as in the verb, like you could never do that unless you're like massive OCD. When we go to the grocery store, I go down every aisle and I'm like, Oh, they got Oreos that taste like watermelon now. Yeah. I'm all in on those. You're never putting that into a search bar, though. Anyways, welcome to uh, Beer and Baseball. This is uh, the third or fourth iteration of this particular podcast. My name is Adam Dellinger. You may have came in in the middle of a tangent conversation. We have two fantastic guests on the show today. They're both professional broadcasters. Before they came on, I asked Kristen why I'm even on the podcast. I guess they need somebody to moderate a couple of pros. And if you're going to do that, why not get an amateur? Uh, Zach is here. Melanie's here as well. I'm not going to introduce them. Uh, as has been the custom so far, you guys can introduce yourself as always. Zach, unfortunately, buddy, ladies first. We'll let Melanie go first here. <laughs> Melanie, how are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm good. Um, I'm currently in Atlanta, Georgia right now, but as of this past February, I was brought on to join the Baltimore Orioles. So I'll have a split role with them. I'll be doing some play-by-play on the radio. We'll be doing sideline reporting for Masson, Mid-Atlantic Sports Network on television, um, community, social, digital, the whole nine. So just really getting to dive into Birdland once we finally get baseball back. Awesome. And we're going to come back uh, to Birdland here momentarily, but I got Zach, uh, Zach Bigley in here too. What's up with you, man? Tell, tell folks about yourself. Well, first of all, Melanie, congrats. We haven't had a chance to talk since last year's Carolina. Congrats <laughs> on the promotion up to the Orioles. Um, uh, like Melanie, I started a new job uh, this year with the Frisco Rough Riders as the uh, manager of media development and uh, broadcaster as well. Although a little bit more media development here is the the season hasn't gotten underway uh, recently. But I was with the Pelicans for two years in Myrtle Beach, and uh, I'm currently quarantined here at my girlfriend's place in Dallas and just trying to to stay healthy and stay positive. Uh, Zach, since you just spoke here, I thought I'd dig right into your deal. You are the manager of media development aside from being a professional broadcaster. I believe I may have an understanding of what exactly that entails, and I'm guessing that it's everything that has to do with promotion of the ball club. But if you could just sort of give us an overview of what that title actually means, man, that'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. And in Myrtle Beach, it working alongside with, with Kristen and working on the marketing and promotion side of things, it's really just doing what you can to represent the ball club from a media perspective. So working with local media, working with, uh, in the case of the Pelicans, working with the Cubs media as well with the bloggers. Cubs fans are, are absolutely crazy. Uh, and here in Frisco, it's been working with the Rangers media and that kind of thing uh, a little bit. And it hasn't had quite the opportunity yet with baseball kind of on hold right now, but really just creating content, so whether that be written, video, anything for social media, working on the website, as uh, I handle a lot of the website stuff here in Frisco, 
Uh, and then we're all getting geared up for our virtual opening day here in Frisco coming up on Thursday the 16th, which would have been our home opener uh, against the Tulsa Drillers. So we're doing a ton of stuff for that. We're rolling out uh, a MLB The Show uh, game, which I'll be calling over the top of. Uh, it would have been against the Tulsa Drillers, so we're, we're doing that against the Tulsa Drillers, and hopefully we'll win. We'll, we'll see about that. But um, And then uh, just a bunch of different stuff uh, with content. So basically, during this time, it, it's unprecedented, as everyone knows, just trying to make sure that everyone realizes that we still exist and that we're excited for baseball to come back when it does come back. And so there really isn't a set role as to what the manager of media development does. It's kind of just doing whatever you can to promote the ball club and, and make sure that we're relevant in this tough time. So I was 100% accurate, and you kind of do everything. That's what I gathered out of that. You, you do yeah, a little bit of everything. It is a little bit of everything, but it's uh, it's a lot of working with other people in the organization. So while, while I have a little bit of everything to do, it's, it's working with – uh, marketing and promotions and social media and video. And, and so it's by no means is it doing anything alone. It's uh, it's a lot of teamwork, which I love. Oh, cool. Uh, Melanie, uh, I should say to congratulations on the promotion. I know that's got to be a, a really, really big deal for you. You're going to be calling for the O's this year. Newman making Aurora. There she is making her Oriole debut with Jeff Arnold. Uh, let's listen in on the Orioles radio network. Just an absolutely beautiful day here at Ed Smith Stadium. Happy to be in Sarasota right now. You almost forget that it's probably half this temperature right now back home in Baltimore. Well, before the game, they always remind you this is the temperature in Baltimore, and this is the temperature in Sarasota. Payoff again to Vallejo. Swing and a bouncer up the third base side. Tristan Gray to the top into the chest, sends it across the diamond. And five. I want to ask you, who's the first person that you called when, when you got the call up to the bigs? Well, so what's funny is, you know, and, and Zach knows this, like you get all those, those chances and they just don't come through all the time. So you kind of groom yourself, just be like, you know what, if it happens, great. And if it doesn't, I've, as long as I have a job, like that's where it counts. So i would had a couple other calls this off season and thought, you know what, at the end of the day, if I get to go back to Salem, I'm happy there. It's good there. Um, so when my agent and I actually started moving forward in negotiations, I started realizing this could be a thing, you know, they, they sound really positive. They sound really engaged, but I didn't want to tell my family yet because they're always the ones that like overbuy and then they're like the most let down. So, um, I, I told my boyfriend first and he knew and he kind of kept it quiet. And then my family and I were playing Bananagrams. And I don't know if you know that, but it's kind of like playing Scrabble with a hundred tiles. So I spelled it out in the tiles because we always go over like our biggest words after a round. And so I said, oh, you know, I lost and I had, I signed a big league contract. And my sister was the only one who even caught on to it. Her and her husband were just staring at me. And my dad and my mom are both trying to check my tiles to see if I had actually spelled it out. And I was like, guys, that's more than one word. Like, hello. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we had some fun with it. But. Did you need to get all the right tiles, Melanie? No, I didn't at all. I think I had, like, contract. But I knew it. Like, I was waiting so bad for us to finally have an, a game night to play Bananagrams because I was like, oh, this is how I want to do it. And so I just, I just bluffed at that point. But I was like, this is our family. Like, they're not even grasping it. They're just trying to fact check that I played the game right. <laughs> now, uh, I, I want to ask you a follow-up question, too. And I want to phrase it properly because I feel like you're going to have an answer that's going to be really good. So, for some reason, baseball, not necessarily late to the party for female play-by-play, -play. obviously uh, – Jessica Mendoza doing great work with ESPN and stuff now. But I, I'm a huge basketball fan as well as uh, a baseball fan also. And, like, Doris Burke is a part of my childhood, being in the booth. Like, I can't imagine watching a basketball game, especially a pro game, late in the year, headed into the playoffs, and not hear Doris Burke's voice. And, frankly, I think she's the best analyst that the NBA has. With that said, who do you look up to now that you're – and do you feel – like, do you feel more scrutinized for being a female? Or is are we in 2020 and we're past that now? Like, I don't – how do you feel about the whole thing? 
I mean, I know I want to be past it, and that's what I was kind of appreciative this year with the Carolina League was like, while other media wanted to talk about it, every other broadcaster in the league was like, you're one of us. Like, that's it. And that's, that's what you want. Like, I don't want it to be different. I don't want people to go, like, oh, but she's a female. Yay. Like, it's great that there's more of us now. Um, but I just want it to be normal because that's what it's been my whole life. And you'll you'll get the – the ignoramus every now and then who wants to make, you know, some comment about it. We're like, Oh, you didn't play. Be like Joe Schmo. Like, where did you play? Cause I don't think you played either. Um, and with that being said, I mean, there's, there's so many people to look up to. I mean, first of all, every partner that I've had in the booth with me has taught me something. They're the reason I'm here because I was brought in in the first place by Justin Baker back in 2014. Um, most of the guys that I work around, my mentors, my peers are men just because there's that many more in the industry and they've been that much more accepting and willing to help me to develop and to sit down. And, and kind of the cool thing with that is one of them was Jeff Arnold, who was with myself and Zach in the Carolina League last year. He also got the call up to Baltimore this year, but he sat down with me almost weekly and would go over my stuff and would help me get better. So to make the jump with somebody who I'm already comfortable with on air, he knows my work. You know, he knows how to talk to me to constructively make it better is a huge help. And then you look at the females and it is a lot on the sideline side, but I think that brings in an element to develop even in the booth. I think they can go hand in hand with each other. So Emily Jones, Julia Morales with Texas and Houston have been huge. Um, watching people like Cindy Brunson, Alana Rizzo, Sophia Minner, her bilingual interviews are a mind blowing art form to watch her handle it. And then the spring training, I got to know Susan Waldman before we called the grapefruit league. And she was just the most inviting. Like I'd never gotten to talk to her before until we met up in Florida and just her enthusiasm to be around the game and watching her recall for stuff. I mean, she was texting me about our players who I hadn't even met yet. And she goes, well, would he fit in this spot in the lineup? Oh, well, never mind. His strikeout rate's too high. And I was like, I need to get to that level. Like that's amazing. Um, but it's, there's so many men and women. I think we kind of do ourselves a disservice by putting like the gender role factor into play. No, no, I understand completely. And like for the people that want to come at you or whatever that say like, Oh, you didn't play. Well, I'm pretty sure that like, I can tell just by talking to you, you're a better athlete than Vern Lundquist or Joe Buck or Brent <laughs> Musburger. Average, <laughs> <but I'll take laughs> go ahead and do it. I'm pretty sure you got Vern handled at this point. Zach, I, uh, I wanted to ask you a question, too, and I, I want to ask this uh, to both of you here. The play-by-play -play thing is really fascinating to me, and when you hear somebody that's an all-time great at it, and we're talking Costas, you know, uh, Vin Scully. I'm talking about the immortals at the play-by-play -play thing. When I'm at home and I'm watching, uh, I'm a Braves fan, all right? It's, it's just, mm. uh, listen to this accent. It's Braves country, all right? <laughs> it's just what it is. When I was a kid, if Jeff Blauser booted a, a routine ground ball, I'm irate and I just explode. How do you guys, it's amazing to me to listen to play-by-play -play how do you guys lock in on not veering in to the color side of things? In other words, there's like a lane and an approach in the broadcast booth, and the ability to stay in that lane has always been really impressive to me. Zach, I'll let you answer that first, man. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it's important to have that emotion still because with the role that I'm in personally, I know Melanie is in and, and all that, the big thing is that we are employees of the team that we are calling for. So I know some people will be mad if a, a team's broadcaster is biased. Remember our paycheck is coming from that team and we are not only being paid by that team, but we're with this team on the road. We're around them constantly. We know these guys personally. And so how I view it is I'm not going to be a complete homer, but I am definitely uh, understanding my audience. And a lot of them are fans of the Pelicans when I work for them and then the Rough Riders here uh, eventually, hopefully this season <laughs> when we start play. And so that's, that's how I call the game. I call the game from that perspective. And so if uh, one of our guys makes an error, then, you know, I'm, not necessarily going to be down on that player because I personally look at it as a positive way of broadcasting, but I, I will always broadcast with that emotion and especially over radio conveying that with your, uh, the way you say words and the conjecture that you have, I think is very important. 
And so, you know, it, drifting over to the color side uh, can sometimes be a little dangerous, but at the same time, when you're broadcasting a game solo, you have to learn how to balance the play-by-play -play and the color as well. So uh, I think that it's a – baseball is unlike any other sport where you have so many games, and a lot of the times you are solo, especially in the minor leagues. And so you have so many opportunities where you have to finish your play-by-play -play and then you transition over into color. And so that's that's something that really – takes a lot of time and a lot of reps. And I, I know I certainly haven't mastered it. I, I know there are tons of people even who in the major leagues who haven't entirely mastered it just because it, it takes so much time and there's, there's never really a way to do it perfectly. But I think the biggest thing when you talk about the Scullies and the Costas and uh, you know, the best play-by-play -play guys and women of all time, it's really about capturing the moment. Whether that be a big moment or a small moment, just knowing when to talk, when not to talk, and, and knowing how to capture the moment with your words is really what sets the greatest apart. Um, and that's what you can really notice as a fan. Melanie? I, I think he nailed it, especially to mention that, you know, most of us are still always going to be developing how we call the game. And, and like he said, you, you have to transition. I was alone in Salem. So you're having a conversation with yourself for four hours versus if you do have that counterpart who can kind of take over and add and mix into that, you know, just, I hate this expression, but at the same time, it makes sense. The whole stay in your lane. So if it is a, a two man booth or, you know, multiple people there knowing like, Hey, I'm going to handle the X's and O's. They've got the rest and letting them speak and kind of finding that chemistry and the, the back and forth to let that develop into a conversation because that's what makes it easier for followers to, to take with unless you're talking over each other all the time and then no one can figure out the direction you're going in and everybody's confused and adding to that still one of my favorite calls from this season and bigly crushed it because it was on sports center for forever and a day. And I was still, um, we were what a month into the season at that point. So I was very new at having to be alone in the booth and there was a, a bunt play, the ball rolled up to the pitcher. He couldn't get a grip on it, so he kicked it to first base, and it was this perfect play. And I remember sitting there in a the booth, and I just got quiet, and I kind of laid out because I was like, that didn't just happen. Like, that's not how that out works. Assad kicked the baseball over to first baseman Cambalego, who picked it up and made the out. We got soccer going on over here, guys. Unbelievable play by the Mexican pitcher for the Pelicans. I don't even know, is that is that a kick out? See something new every day in baseball, guys. And uh, that may have just been it right there for the week. And then when we got to watch it, when the play went viral later and I got to listen to his call, he crushed it. The 0-1 home. A bunt shown, he pulls it with him up the first baseline. Assad fields on the tip of his glove. He bobbles, he kicked it to first. Oh my goodness, Javier Assad. Holy cow. He fielded on the tip of his glove and then he kicked it to first when he bobbled it. You have got to be kidding me. Like he almost knew that was gonna come. It was so crazy, but he, he captured the emotion and the craziness and, and just everything perfectly and stayed on top of the call the whole time. And, and that's having that sense of, you know, this is when to come in and out of a call. It was awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think it's, I think it's really funny when you, when you look at a play like that, because there are so many different ways to call any sport. Like there's no blueprint on how exactly to call a play. And in the way that, that Melanie called it, I, I heard her call. It was, still a good way to call it. It was just different from the approach that I took. I got very excited and was yelling and screaming. <laughs> Melody was shocked. And I mean, both are, both are accurate ways to react to that play. And so I think that, you know, both ways capture the moment in a different way and they both capture it in, in, a, in a good way. Hey, your team came out on top of that play and we lost to a soccer play. <laughs> That's, hey, listen, I want to I wanna follow up right there because I think... Uh, that's a that's a fantastic point by, by both of you. I remember as a kid, um, Vince Scully, and then Costas followed him for a little while in the solo calls during the World Series. Now we seem like we're so far removed from that, right? Because now we've got a seven-person pregame panel, and then we're going to throw down to the booth. May have four folks in the booth, and we're probably going to have two, sometimes three 
on-field analyst, right? But Costas and Scully are calling this stuff solo back in the day, and of course they both had a great deal of radio experience also. My favorite call of all time is a play that is ultra-famous and celebrated an anniversary uh, here a couple weeks ago, and I watched the video a million times, but it was the 88 World Series. It's a game one when Gimpy Kirk Gibson you know, hits the home run as he hits the pinch hit off of uh, Eckerson. There, something happened to Ben Scully, and he was great at this, and Costas was great at it. There is a time when Kirk Gibson is running the bases, and he's, he's this move. Everybody knows this move. Okay, he's pumping his fist, and he's doing his arm. Ben Scully doesn't say a word, all right? There's a great deal of silence, and by him saying nothing, did everything for that particular call. You're sort of taking it in as a fan, and everybody's appreciating the play that just happened in and of itself. Is that a feeling? And I started uh, with Zach last time. So, Melanie, I'll start with you this time. Can you feel that while you're calling a game? I definitely think you can, and I think there's also, though, a difference. You alter it just a little bit if it's a TV game versus a radio game. Like if we were, if we were at home, we had MILB TV, and I knew that there were going to be those moments you could lean into the silence and the crowd reaction a little more. And that's also again assuming because minor and major league baseball are different that you have enough fans at the event for a minor league game to make that difference in crowd reaction in the first place. Because otherwise, it can get a little awkward. Um, but that was something I started to pick up on, especially later towards the end of the year. I think we had seven walk-off wins in our final 20 games. And so looking at my first couple calls from those walk-offs and then analyzing that going in and the rest just started, you know, you call it, you let them know that it's a walk-off win and then you just kind of amp it up and you let them hear the guys screaming as they run out of the dugout and take it in. And then you slowly come back in, you know, all right, we're going to go to the post game show after this and, and feed into that. So analyzing the difference in in minor and major leagues and radio and tv but a hundred percent there are those moments you just you have to lay out and you have to let everything around you support what you've been talking about all night yeah i absolutely agree i think that the most important thing with big calls and vin scully is fantastic at this and all the great broadcasters are is letting it breathe and you think about an exclamation point if you're trying to make a big point in a speech. You don't want to hammer home the point and then just keep talking after. And it's not just with home runs or, or anything like that. It's, you know, nice plays in the infield or the outfield or anything like that. You hit it and you let it breathe and then you come in with context. And like Melanie said, the radio and TV broadcasts are very different on how you like to do that. If you have a big crowd, you can let it breathe a little bit for radio. If you have a big crowd for TV, you can let it breathe for a lot longer. And one of my favorite Vin Scully stories is when he called uh, Hank Aaron's 715th home run to beat Babe Ruth's record down in Atlanta. He called the home run, and then he put the headset down, got up, got a drink of water, and came back, put the headset back on, and then said those famous words where not only is it a great day for baseball, but a great day for the country and the world and all that. Um, but, you know, Vin Scully was, was truly one of a kind. He, there are not many who can carry a TV booth by themselves now. I mean, it helps when you're able to recall Jackie Robinson stories and, and all that. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was just a, a treat to listen to him call a game. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly miss him here in the industry. But the ability to let the game breathe, which Joe Buck, I think, does a fantastic job in the postseason. And, of course, the crowds and the moments are there. But um, letting the game breathe is, is really important. Yeah. Uh, great point about Joe Buck, too. I, I'm not a fan, and he is so stinking good. Like, it's the most frustrating thing ever. I'm like, you know, I don't like you, but you're really, really good at your job, which is probably why I don't like you, because there's no real other rhyme or reason to it, right? It's just like he's incredible at it. Um, with that said, you guys ever thought about catchphrases? All honesty. Has anybody ever thought about a catchphrase? All honesty. Have you sat and thought about it, even just one second? A home run call, anything of that nature? No. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I got to I gotta agree with him. It's a no. Because someone even asked, uh, what's your first Orioles home run call going to sound like? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but you just, you can't do that. And I know that, especially when you look at broadcasters of old, 
ain't the beer cold was a, was a Baltimore staple for years. And I think those work in certain situations, but I also think that goes to that broadcaster's personality. You know, I, you, you can have a signature sign off. I think that's a little different than a, a catchphrase or a cliche because it gives that sense of rhythm, you know, the, the ball game's over. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I agree. In in some, like, put it in the books, I rose great. Uh, and yeah. I mean, so my favorite broadcaster of all time, Dave Niehaus, Seattle Mariners broadcaster, unfortunately passed away in 2010. And his home run call was fly away. And every time there was a grand slam, it was get out the rye bread and mustard, grandma. It's a grand salami. And I mean, those those are fun. But uh, at the same time, ooh, I got you. <laughs> you did. Yeah, but it, I mean, those are, those are great. But there are so many different types of home runs that, for me, it feels a little bit gimmicky to have a home run call. Um, there are wall scrapers. There are, you know, absolute no doubters and stuff like that. So I think it just sounds better if you let it come to you. And it sounds better in highlight tapes. It sounds better in the moment. And uh, that's kind of how I look at it. It seems to be like, I don't know, sort of like out with the 90s. Like if I never have to hear – put it on the board yes ever again like i'm like i'm 100 percent down with that and not like or all the classic i don't know do you guys ever think that corny is kind of cool sometimes because like as far as the yankees are concerned like i think all of that stuff's really really corny but also too it's just like so specific to the yankees that it works like does that make sense because i know you guys both mentioned you know stadium and team specific you know sort of broadcast elements I guess what I'm trying to ask here is that that sort of stuff works in its time and its place, correct? Yeah, and that's what it kind of goes back to again with like the personality of the broadcaster and if they can use that. It's also the makeup of your team, your city, and everything that ties into that. It's a very case-by-case -case basis thing in my opinion. And and like you said, the Yankees, I mean, they're they're steeped in history and ritual and – you know, every little superstition that they hold on to. So they, they probably have a lot more than, say, the Rays. Yeah, it's going to sound weird when John Sterling isn't calling Yankee games on the radio. You can uh, say it's corny. You can say whatever you want. But the day that he doesn't call a game on the radio anymore for the Yankees, it's going to be weird. I had uh, – I, I went – to a back-to-back -back Astros series at Yankee Stadium. I believe that was in July of this year. And uh, honest to goodness, dude, like one of the first things I did when I got to my seats was, where's the broadcast booth? Can I see him right now? You know what I mean? Like it was just one of those things. And uh, you're exactly right about that. I want to ask you a question too, because I, I do a live morning radio show and I've done it for 15 years in three different towns. I started in Greensboro. I was in San Antonio for a little while. And now, of course, I'm in Myrtle Beach. There are a lot of times that I go on the air and I get something wrong or I do something that just doesn't work. I want to hear your best I messed it up story. Can I get one of those? Zach, you want to go first? Oh, my God. How much time do you have? Um, as much as you want, baby. <laughs> I mean, everybody has those stories. And I, I mean, it's whether it's the small thing, whether it's the big thing, um, I mean, any, any broadcaster has messed up stats before. Any broadcaster has messed up dates before. Um, my favorite is uh, when the scoreboard is wrong and you go off the scoreboard. I've, uh, <laughs> I've called the final out of a game when it was the second out of the night and then we ended up losing. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it, just stuff like that. I mean, it, you, you just have to laugh it off. And I, I know Melanie is, is the same way where we all fumble our words. We're human. Um, so you just kind of make fun of yourself, say, wow, that was articulate, and then kind of move on and uh, just have fun with it. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, you can't, you can't get through without fumbling. And, again, just looking back at this past season and going in as timid as I was to the fact that I was by myself for the first time in my career – there was a lot at the beginning of me being unsure and it just, it kind of would add up where I'd be like, I don't even want to listen to that game ever again, like put it away. But the guys would always call it because they knew because all their parents are listening. So I'd get on the bus and we'd have like our third base and he's like, you know, that was an out, right? It's not, you know, whatever I had, whatever I had botched. And I was like, thanks dude. Like, yeah, I'm highly aware. Cause by the time I went to commercial break, I was like, wow, that happened. And then they had a play. Um, I hated it because it ended up, 
on a couple different social media sites, not for my call, but because we had two outfielders who completely lost ball. Well, so did the broadcaster. And you can hear it because I was like, it's going to center right. And, and my brain's just like, dude, I have no idea. I have no idea where that went at all. And then, and then you finally see it with them. I was like, well, we're on the same page of not knowing anything at all. It's great. Fine. The, the best part about those is when you're not solo. And what people don't realize is when you have somebody in the booth with you, there's always that moment of eye contact. <laughs> where it's like, what did you just say? <laughs> it's, it's the best. I mean, that's some of my favorite moments from the season. And I'm sure Melanie, you agree with this when you have a partner is those moments of eye contact or like shaking your head or like pushing the person next to you or making fun of them in a nonverbal way. Just kind of the, that kind of thing is so much fun about broadcasting. Oh yeah. Well, I'm sure you've, you've seen the booth up from Frisco and you know how high it sits and bless Ryan Roulard when I was working with him because I hadn't updated my contacts prescription because I couldn't afford it. So I don't, I don't know if you've gotten to watch a home run from the booth, but they can be really hard to read those first couple weeks when you're getting a feel for how that field plays. And he just got to the point where he would look at me when I was calling it because he knew I could not see if that was out or in. And he would just start yeah. like, hey, <laughs> like he said, it's a home run. Perfect. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to ask you guys a question about this too, and I, because honestly, I don't know how it works. But my situation is a little bit different now because I, I, I am the morning show host, but I'm also the program director, which would typically be the person that oversees the morning show, and then the operations manager would oversee the program director. I'm also that person now too, so it's really weird, like how that thing works. But when I did morning shows in the past, you know, you'd finish up. And then you'd have to go meet with the program director and they would kind of go over a lot of the mistakes that I made. What, how does that operate uh, in the uh, sports play by play or analyst world? Like how much feedback are you guys getting? And, um, you know, just how, how does that work? Who's telling you what and, and do you let that stuff get to you or do you try to make it make you better? Like what's the deal? Uh, well, I, I think that, Everybody in the industry, if they're not, they should. And I think that everyone does is they send out their tape to a bunch of different people and ask for feedback. And I know that over the last few years, I've had four or five people that I will send a tape to and get one every month. Um, I know that it's just something to, to make sure that you're not falling in a rut. And I'd listen to my tape a lot. And I think that just listening to yourself and making sure that you're calling the right things, not falling into certain crutch words, um, which is basically just saying a word over and over again and not understanding that that's what you're saying over and over. Um, and so I, I think that that is super important and not having an ego in this industry at all. I know that the, with, with me being the number one for my first year last year, my assistant Noah Clunan, who just took over, he's now the voice of the Pelicans with me moving on to Frisco, he and I would sit down and, and we'd listen to each other's tape and, even though he was my assistant, you know, I, I really don't care at all. You know, any feedback is good from anybody. And of course you take everything with a grain of salt, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you're hearing uh, what other people have to say, because maybe they're picking up on something that you haven't picked up uh, on during those listens. So uh, making those contacts, getting those connections and making sure that anybody who cares about things in the industry or knows what they're talking about, hears your tape and, and can give you feedback on how to improve. Yeah, and I agree with him. I mean, it really comes down to you making sure that you're reaching out to people and sending your stuff out. That's the most guaranteed way to get any feedback, especially on the minor league side of things. Because for most of us, you know, we're, it's kind of like you. Like, we, we run everything. We cue the commercials where no one is sitting there kind of holding us accountable for that. Now, I can say, you know, the, the one game I've gotten to be a part of with Baltimore after we got off, I did have our producers and everybody else who's reaching out and saying, you know, how did you feel about that? And, and we noticed this and we saw this and it's, it's good to have that, but you really do have to be self accountable to reach out and have people that you trust, who know you, um, you, you guys know how to speak to each other, to be constructive with things and just seeing what they have to say. And I agree with him entirely. It doesn't really matter someone's position, especially if you trust them and you, you like their style and you know that they know your stuff just kind of bring it in and, and be willing to hear what they have to say. And honestly, I'd rather listen to what someone has to say about my tape than listening to myself. That's like my least favorite activity in the world. 
but it's a necessary evil for us. Yeah, I'm like, that's not a thing. Like, if <laughs> if I ever get feedback and somebody's like, uh, hey, man, that, you know, that segment you did or that parody of this, man, that was great. And I'm like, yeah, oh, thanks. I appreciate it, but I ain't trying to hear that. <laughs> like, I just... I'm never listening to my own radio show. I, that's abysmal. Who wants to do that? I appreciate <laughs> the people do, however. I should mention, over the course of, we'll say the last seven or eight years or so, because I remember when I got uh, Twitter sort of, to me, Twitter is the place where the vile internet lives. It used to be YouTube, but all those hateful people have moved to Twitter now. Like, I don't know why that's a thing, but it, it is real. Uh, and I remember when I first got Twitter, like I'm looking for athletes, right? Or uh, and I'm like, man, does does MJ have a Twitter? Does LeBron have a Twitter? And this is the early days. Like, what's Kobe doing over there? Like, does A Rod have a Twitter? And then all of a sudden, we've sort of like morphed out. And I want to follow Joe Buck on Twitter. You know what I mean? Like, I want to follow uh, Chip Carey on, on Twitter. And I would imagine that. You guys are getting feedback now in real time of what it is that you're doing. Now, obviously, I know that nobody is going to say that they're pulling their phone out and looking at Twitter during a broadcast. So we'll just go ahead and say that that's not a thing. But how much do you let uh, that instant feedback now sway you in, in any direction? Because if, if you, we would have been having this conversation 20 years ago, that's a question that doesn't even come up. The technology's not there. So, Melanie, you want to speak on that first? Um, yeah, I, I'll say that, first of all, my list of people who are blocked is about as long as the list of words that I have filtered out of my tweets to where those tweets won't even show up if that word is in them. Um, and that was one thing Steve Berthium with the Arizona Diamondbacks taught me very early on that was so hard to grasp was just don't react to trolls. Don't react to people you don't know who are saying inflammatory things on Twitter because they thrive there. They love it. And sometimes you just see something and you're like, oh, like I just want to, you know, I want to send that verbal punch back. But it's, it's not going to do anything. That's all they want is a reaction in the first place from someone that they've never met before. Um, and, and I will say now that we're, we're in this situation, you know, in the minors, you, you have one or two people. A lot of the time it's parents who were responding or they'd say like, Oh my gosh, you told this story about our kid. And like, we didn't know anybody knew that we love it. It's great. Um, and now that being in the big leagues and having a little bit of a different sense of, I guess, audience around, I, it was actually said to me by one of our executives. They said, you know what, for 24 hours after you're on air, do not look at your mentions. Do not look at your notifications. Just don't engage at all. And I know even Jessica Mendoza has spoken on that before too. She'll give it 48 hours after she does a broadcast before she looks at anything. And I, I've gotten way thicker skin since I started, you know, 11 years ago doing this. So a lot of stuff doesn't bother me as much anymore. Um, but the people who you know, who you want to hear from, they're going to text you or email you or direct message you. They're not going to, to tweet at you about something unless it's Mike Farron and he finds something that Jeff Arnold and I said funny, which is about par for the course. But everybody else, it's just you got to block it out. I'm not even going to pretend to be on the same stratosphere as Melanie with this. But <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is just the way it is. Like, as a female in this business, the stuff that she has to deal with is ridiculous. And there's yeah. no there's no getting around that. And I mean, I, I'm sure she can speak to this as well, where when you get that positive message from a parent, from a fan, it makes your day. It, it's really, really nice. It's really sweet. But the negative stuff can can bring you down a little bit um it, and i mean it's just as simple as that i don't really think there's much else to be said from what melanie said it's just you can't let it get to you you have to just uh just keep going i know after my first ever broadcast in summer collegiate ball a season ticket holder wrote a page-long email just bashing me um and i kept it and I, I actually deleted it like last year but i kept it for a long time as motivation and, uh, and so, I mean, it's just, it's stuff like that. You, you know, you can't let it get to you and you have to just try and improve every day and stay within yourself. And we're in a very public eye and obviously Melanie more than, than me and, and a lot of other minor league broadcasters now, but 
when you're in a public eye and when you're in a position where people can throw punches at you and then duck behind a screen, you have to be able to just absorb those and, and not fight back because you're the one who's going to get caught. Well, with that said, let me just go ahead and tell you, I make my living doing this radio show, but y'all are professional broadcasters. I only consider myself semi-pro um, because I'm just too immature to be a professional. Do not come at Zach or Melanie with any garbage on Twitter because guess what? They got like 24-hour and 48-hour rules. I got no rules. I will come blast you. Again, semi-pro, all right? Semi-pro only. But I did want to ask both of you, too, is there a growing pressure? <laughs> pressure may not be the right word either. Let me just lay a bunch of words out, and, and I'll try to convey this properly. But is there a sense of need to grow your brand you know what I mean in a way to where you don't want to be caught up in social media because you don't want all the garbage that comes with it but you almost it's a necessity now I mean do you feel the need to do that and I'm sure with you know obviously Masson is going to have you know a set of standards and everything and then things that you're going to be forced to do on social media media maybe you wouldn't do otherwise but how do you balance that out I guess is the question here like how do you use it to your advantage, but also sort of keep the crap away? Yeah. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that with Masson because that's in our contracts, you know, there's a code of conduct and it, it made me laugh initially because someone said, you know, have you gone through with that whole trend that people had of digging through athletes accounts and pulling inflammatory tweets from 10 years ago and attacking them over it? They said, have you ever, you know, do you need to go through and clean stuff out? I said, look, my dad is in the military. My mother is a teacher. When I made Facebook in high school, they were livid. So my social media, luckily, has always been operated to the nines as far as what's gone out there. Um, our Twitter, my Twitter account was created as a college request it for one of my classes. Uh, so it was, it was a really fortunate situation where mine was always approached with more of a professionalism in the first place. Now, I will say, with Twitter, I think it, it does kind of have a bigger usage, especially for us and especially for sports in general versus some other even generations are like, you know, I don't, I don't need Twitter. I don't want to read that. They're in to, to TikTok and Instagram and everything else. And I wouldn't probably have either of those accounts if it wasn't for being in this field. And, and those are followed to strict algorithms. You know, Instagram, I have to post these days at these times and it needs to be this content. We have to rotate it out because you start to utilize it as networking and marketing, like you said, your brand, um, rather than operating it on just a personal level. And the plus side to operating it like that is just the number of people that I've gotten to connect with through social media. It's so tough on our industry. And I know Zach and I have talked about this before for friendships, relationships, anything, because we don't operate normally. We have to have people that are okay with the fact that we're pretty much not present for eight months out of the year. And because of social media, we get to connect with other broadcasters and people in the industry who get it. And we develop these awesome friendships and relationships that aren't contingent upon face-to-face -face and quality time interactions. They know that when we get the time to catch up, we're going to catch up. But other than that, we'll, we'll check on each other from afar and, and see how we're doing and roll with it. And they're a big reason why I'm still here was because when I've hit those walls and I've hit those struggle periods, it's people I've never even met in my life, but I consider them some of my closest friends that were able to pull through and say, hey, you know, like you're here for a reason, keep going. And, and they've done the same with me. And I think it's not only the, the broadcast side of things, but there are a lot of different pockets in Twitter that you can look at a lot of Twitter and be like, wow, it's a horrible place. But there are some very good things about Twitter as well. And I think that, like Melanie said, the broadcast community on Twitter is very supportive and they are very good for people who are trying to make it in this industry. They'll be very helpful. And for the most part, it's a very positive experience overall. And so I think that building that brand and building those relationships over Twitter is very important. And I think it's interesting how much Twitter is a part of this community as well, where if you're a broadcaster and you don't have a Twitter, it's like, what are you doing? Unless you've you know, already made it. Howie Rose just made his Twitter like two days ago. So good for him. But <laughs> I mean, it's crazy how how Twitter is, is so important in, in this industry. And um, I think it's great. I think it's, there's a lot of positives about it. And I think building that brand is super important. And, and like Melanie said, like my Twitter is strictly professional. It's all uh, 
you know, broadcast stuff and, and stuff about the Pelicans or the Rough Riders or, or that kind of thing. Uh, and that's a personal choice that I've made. I have no qualms about people who, who do it in a different way. That's just how I choose to represent myself on Twitter. Um, and I, again, there's no blueprint for any of this stuff. It's really whatever you make it. And so uh, I, I think that it's a really good medium to express yourself and get your message out, get that out there, get your content out there. Um, connect with people and, and really use it in whatever way you think is the best for your brand. Um, I only, I know it's getting rather lengthy and I appreciate both of you taking the time today too. I do have a couple more questions though. I am a, uh, you, you, cause Zach, you mentioned how the community as far as broadcasters, writers, people around sports and, and how beneficial that can be. I'm a Bill Simmons guy. Like I'm all over everything. Bill Simmons is throwing out. Like if he's putting it out, I'm picking it up. Doesn't mean I always agree with him, but I'm following Simmons. I'm following Ryan Rosillo too. Why don't you guys uh, give folks a couple of decent ads, Melanie? Oh boy, that's on the spot. I feel like I follow so many different people. Um, huh? Well, I think Jeff Levering and Emily Jones right now, the way that they've been handling the pause in uh, in what we're doing has been great. They're they're keeping it fresh. They're keeping it really introspective. Um, Evan Grant as well, who's a beat writer in Dallas, he's been producing a decent amount of content on a regular basis. That's been really insightful to look at. I mean, you ha you have your your big dogs like Jeff Passan and, and Ken Rosenthal, and they're always going to be at the front line of as far as if you're looking for people to keep you informed instead of reading into speculation and rumors and everything else that are swirling. Um, I probably have a list that's three times longer than that, that I could come back to, but you just, you know, you get used to seeing these people on a daily basis and, and that's where you feel that connection is seeing that they're still continuing to interact. But uh, Jeff Levering might be one of my favorites right now. I was trying to cheat and see if I could grab something real quick. I love Pitching Ninja just as a, yes. a to follow. Um, you know, obviously follow MLB and MILB and all that stuff. John Boy has been a, a great follow as well for just some comedy. Um, he does a lot of breakdowns of, of baseball and he did a few minor league breakdowns, which was really fun. Um, you know, there are just so many. It's really tough to say. I know that's the worst answer of all time, but, uh, I, you know, just go and, and try and search. Everyone has the time right now, and you can find a lot of people who are great to follow. And uh, that's the great thing about Twitter is you can follow them if you don't like some of the content they're putting out, then you can unfollow them. And, that's, well, uh, and what I like with that, too, is I don't know if you noticed, but when you follow someone, it pulls a list of suggested follows based on them. You can go down a rabbit hole and just like, following from one to the next recommendations. Also too, just like completely out of sports talk, but you guys are looking for a great Instagram follow John Mayer. I mean, I just can't recommend it enough. Uh, anyways, but that said, uh, I do, I, I, I've alluded to it a couple of times here, but um, I, I do the, the morning show here on the country station in Myrtle beach. Now it's no secret to the folks over uh, with the Myrtle beach Pelicans that country music is not my, uh, not my preferred format, but when you have this accent, you are put over there on that radio station. You sound like a cowboy, so you do the cowboy music, okay? Uh, I have loved sports since I was a kid. My dad was a baseball player uh, at the collegiate level, and I grew up around sports, and, and it would have made me so happy to be in a booth calling a game, but my story is a little different. I knew I wanted to be a broadcaster. Uh, one day I was on the way to a, it was a broadcast journalism class, I believe it was a late afternoon class, and uh, I was listening to Howard Stern on Sirius, he had Paul McCartney in the studio, and I had read an article prior to that interview, a couple of months prior, he had signed an extension with Sirius worth $500 million for five years, and so I'm on the way to class and I said, well, they're giving Howard a half a billion dollars and he's hanging out talking to a Beatle. I want a radio show. I think that's what I want to do. However, my passion would have been to be in a broadcast booth. How did you guys get into that and not go the route of TV sports director or a disc jockey like me or whatever? What did you guys are communications people. You could have went a million different directions. You guys can both answer that question. I'd love to hear it. Well, first of all, how's the $500 million? <laughs> Uh, you'll have to take that up with my wife. I'm way off, dude. Zach, I am way off, bro. 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, to be honest with you, it's pretty simple for me. It's, uh, I played baseball in high school. Wasn't good enough to play at Oregon where I wanted to go. Um, and so I went to Oregon and I figured out the next best thing was to, to talk in the booth. And um, that's what I did. Joined student radio and fell in love with, with calling games. And I think that I, no disrespect to anybody who loves studio work, but for me personally, I think there's no greater thrill than calling live sports because you get to show that emotion and show that passion and tell stories and just have the game dictate the flow of the broadcast where uh, I don't find it as enjoyable personally to be in studio. I've done a lot of studio work and having nothing out in front of you and being stuck in a cubicle and then that kind of thing isn't necessarily my cup of tea when it comes to broadcasting. So I just love being able to look out over the baseball diamond, the football field, the basketball court, whatever, describe the action and uh, kind of show that enthusiasm. That's one of my favorite things about doing sports in general is, you know, the big plays and telling the stories and um, showing everybody that I truly love what I'm doing. And it's a little um, different for me. And that's what I used to tell people I struggled with was you meet all these other broadcasters. Like, Oh, I knew since I was five that I wanted to be broadcast. Like I wanted to be a teacher and then a vet and then a bunch of other things. I was an introverted kid. I was terrified of speaking to anyone, but I loved the game. I loved being around it. So I got involved with our team in high school. I kept the book. I traveled with them. I did anything I could and really got into print journalism until I got to Troy University and they told me they wanted to switch me from a print major to a broadcast major. We were lucky to have you know, two different majors for each different faculty. And so I, I said, okay, you know, I trusted them. They knew what they were doing and what they were looking at and got into it. And like Zach, I started out thinking like, oh, I'm gonna do studio and hosting. But once I tried live broadcasting and it's that pressure of, you know, you're on right then and you have to get it. There's no redos. There's no edits. I, I got addicted. Um, got a couple opportunities in college to call for some of our D1 programs and then, you know, just kind of try to figure out my way from there. I've told a lot of students now who are coming out, you know, I turned down being a part of a news station and, and I think that's still a viable role to get to where you want to be if you're looking more at the TV side than the radio side of things, because I didn't have anybody to tell me that. So I made it very hard on myself by immediately jumping into independent and minor league baseball and realizing, you know, it's not a year guarantee. You, you don't have benefits, you know, you don't have set hours or anything like that. And that being said, I wouldn't trade my path that I've had for the world. So I got an opportunity in 2014 and got really lucky that Justin Baker was a partner who I'd been friends with for 10 years. So he knew how much I love the game. And he was the one who said, you know, I know that we brought you in to do X, Y, and Z, but I want you to come in the booth with me. And it was terrifying at first. So I was like, you know, what do I have to offer to this role? But um, once, once I got those two years under my belt with him and realized just how much I wanted to, to be there for the day in and day out and to let fans know what's going on, you don't look back after that. Well, I've always, and that's a great point, too, because you, you mentioned somebody specifically right there. And I've always told folks, like, I don't think people understand if you get up and, and you really feel like you have a relationship with somebody you may listen to on the radio or when you're watching a ball game on television, like, you know, whatever it is, everybody has to have a champion uh, that's working in their corner. And I firmly believe in that because I don't think a lot of people understand. I know that all three of us have very similar jobs that are kind of on the same interstate, but they're all kind of in different degrees of whatever direction they're going. And people don't really understand that if the person in charge doesn't believe that you're what fits the brand, maybe you sound this particular way or whatever, you could be replaced, uh, you know, tomorrow or whatever. And I think that once you, you know, I, I bet you that all three of us have somebody that we can look back at, even at this point in our career, even if it's just starting or we're somewhere in the middle, that really went to bat for us. So uh, both of those answers are fantastic. Now, I have two more questions. The first, I'm going to present a scenario, and you guys got to be honest with me, all right? It's the end of July, and it could be in the minors or it could be in the bigs, but it's, it's the end of July. It's hot. We're in the dog days. You got a day game you're calling, all right? Or like, or seven o'clock or something like that. And let's say that you're 12 and a half out of first place, all right? Like it's it's looking pretty bleak at this point. 
how locked in are you in the booth and what are you doing that nobody can see in the booth in that particular scenario? Zach, you want to start? Uh, probably eating. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, you have to be locked into every game. And I mean, there are definitely some games where you're tired and you want to go home and <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's tough. And minor league baseball is, is so interesting because I know, Melanie can definitely speak to this. We had a stretch where we had, what, 27 in a row, I think it was? Without an off day, yeah. yeah it was like we watched the Carolina League. Um, so that was really tough. And I know that down the stretch of that, I was feeling it. And <laughs> it getting uh, once you got into the seventh, eighth innings, you're like, all right, um, let's pick it up a little bit here. But, uh, I mean, you know, you, you love the game, and that's, that's really the big thing. But uh, when you have a partner in the booth, um, especially in radio where it's a little bit less play-by-play -play in color. It's more, uh, you know, you kind of hop in if you want to when, you, when your partner is on play-by-play. -play. A lot of times uh, when Noah was, was on the air and I, was, and I was off, I would be eating or, you know, scrolling through Twitter or, <laughs> you know, just kind of taking a break, relaxing a little bit. And, I mean, still watching the game and keeping score and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I, I think that when you have a 140-game season, it's very difficult to be locked in over the course of all 140 games. And when you have an opportunity to kind of just take a breath and, and step out of it for a little bit, and if you are lucky enough to have a partner and do that, uh, I think that's super important to, to do that and kind of just uh, take that time to, to make sure that you can stay within yourself and then kind of uh, get back into it and, and set that focus again once you're back on play-by-play. -play. Yeah, and I agree with him. And I think it just comes down, you know, don't take yourself so seriously. And like you said, especially in the minor leagues, you get to those dog days and it can be so difficult. And you know, the fans are probably feeling the same way. It's not like they're waking up every day like, all right, we're 13 back, let's go, which somehow has happened to be most of the teams I've been with haven't had a prayer of reaching. Um, so, you know, you, you take a little liberty to, to tell some more stories, to go off cue with that I know that year in Frisco for Ryan and I, we started developing segments out of the air. We made one that was like every sixth inning. We started describing the color of the sky, but he would use this like very detailed Pantone color chart to use words for colors we had never heard of in our life. And then, you know, just like you'd, you'd spend that half inning talking about it. And of course you, you keep up with the action because I think that's the huge balance there is you don't want to get away from not letting the fans know what's going on you just get a little more creative about what stories you can feel free to to weave into that mix having those colorful guys that have been the journeymen help because they're always going to have something that you can use that day from everywhere that they've played before um but the same thing we've i've had a partner who came in to join me from a different team for a game because again we're solo this year and I think we spent two innings talking about cheese. Like, it just – it happens sometimes. I can definitely agree with him. I think I've mastered being able to, to eat and move the mic and mute and come back at the same time just because it's almost like snacks keep you going at that point. Um, and, you know, making sure that you're best friends with someone who has a desk fan because those games can – You'll, you'll drop 10 pounds from the start of first pitch to the final out. <laughs> I love those – the no, market kind of evens it out a little bit, but right? yeah, actually, I want to I want to hop in and ask a question to Melanie because I know every broadcaster is with this. Uh, do you have a tick at all that you do? Because I'm a very fidgety person, and so like seventy percent of the time, I'll always have a baseball in my hand when I'm calling the game and just like fidgeting with it or messing with it. Do you have anything like that that you do while you're calling the game? Uh, it just depends. I like that you mentioned like the crutch words earlier because I got off a call this past spring training and they said, you know, I think it was incredible or something. Like you use that seven times. I counted, you know, I didn't know. I didn't, <laughs> you just, your brain latches on. It's like, I really like that word. Let's go. Um, with Salem this last year, we had a, a windowsill and you saw it. It's about two and a half feet wide. So I was a little more still in Salem because that became my spot. I had my cords were long enough so I could take my book and go sit on the windowsill and kind of call the game and, and hang out and terrify the season ticket holders because they're waiting for me to splat on the pavement below. Um, you know, if I have a clicky pin, that I'm, I'm rotating it and twisting it and clicking it every time. <laughs> it's like little stuff like that. Or, you know, you find something that you want to dive into to talk about and jump on Google. 
Um, oh gosh. I want to say like I had specific stuff with Frisco and, and Mobile, but I can't remember now. And I will say in Frisco, those, those July games, if we had a TV game, I was down in the concrete media well, and they used a temp gun and all, we had 20 days where it didn't drop below 104. And the real feel in the dugout was 130 and up. Um, so I actually watched the game through a fan and was like, you know what, if a ball comes, I'm going to take like a little oscillating fan of the face, but whatever, <laughs> like you have to deal with it. I can't tell you how many times that I broke a mechanical pencil like in the middle of an inning. Just oh my god! Fidgeting with it, and then yeah. just have to sit there and not not be able to do anything. <laughs> like when you break your own fidgety toys, yeah, and you're like, exactly. oh, there, you go. there it is. <laughs> Listen, guys, I, it's not specific to baseball. Kristen called the assistant or associate now general manager for the Myrtle Beach Pelicans. She was on the call. She's been in the studio and she's seen it. These are my initials. Uh, ACD, my name's Adam Christopher Dellinger. Every piece of paper that I've got when I'm doing my morning show, when we're doing this podcast right now, I am in, it's just incessantly drawing I, I my initials that. over. But it is, I doodle nonstop, and it's just a thinking mechanism. Like, I'm completely locked into the conversation. I'm locked into everything that's happening. But it's just like something that, it's almost like it keeps me from losing focus, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's – it's just something you don't even think about sometimes. You're just messing with uh, something or drawing or doing doing whatever. Yeah, it, it helps. And also, bless you guys, because I love the stories about, you know, late July and you're having to remain locked in because even as a Braves fan, which I mentioned earlier, there's nights in the middle of July and they're up six in their first place in the East, but they're in the 14th or something in Philadelphia and it's, you know, 1230 and I'm silently praying. I'm like, well, Reese Hoskins just hit a home run and walked this thing off so I can go to bed. Like, just take the loss. Will somebody score a run at this point? And I've never thought about that from the perspective of the broadcaster. So I appreciate uh, your transparency there. Last question before I let you guys roll. We're going to name this segment. I don't know what it's going to be called, but I've kind of done this on uh, most of the podcasts so far. I want you guys to talk about a broadcaster, a coach, or a player that you've had the fortune to interact with who well, is just an exceptional human being. Just brag on somebody you've had the chance to meet. Zach, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess the first person that comes to mind is is Ryan Rillard. I know someone Melanie knows very well, having worked under him here in Frisco for a year. Um, one of my best friends, we went to college together. He was uh, my first sports director in the student radio station, and then he's helped me along the way as a, a mentor and, and someone really just to look up to. He uh, has a great work ethic and um, – Really, you talk to anybody all around minor league baseball. He was one of the more talented guys all across minor league baseball at, at calling the game, at, at writing, at really producing a, a good product. Um, and he has such a good heart, and he uh, d decided to, to leave broadcasting, and uh, he wanted to, to really help people. That's what he wanted to do with his life. His mother was a physician. His brother is a nurse, and, and so he is uh, pursuing firefighting. Uh, in Colorado right now and uh, just so proud of, of him and everything that he's taught me just uh, about broadcasting about uh, going through this industry all the times that he's helped me when uh, we were you know, going through a tough time and, and vice versa and just having someone to call I uh, I really appreciate everything that he's done for me and I know he has touched a lot of people in this industry and as Melanie can attest to and uh, just a really good person overall and somebody who I'm very proud to call a friend. Well, and I want to touch on what Zach said there about Ryan. It's so funny because the first time I met Zach when we played each other this season, my brain was like, he reminds me of someone and I can't place it, but I know it. And then he finally goes, yeah, Ryan and I were roommates. He's one of my best friends. I was like, that's it. Like, they're just so similar in personality and how they prep for the game. And, and watching Ryan that year was really the first time, A, that I got a sense of what preparation it does take to go into a broadcast, but he really was unbelievable to watch because he would go down and do our on-field pregame show, and I would kind of go through the rundown on, on air while he did that, but he would do like a 15-minute segment, and it would be on this day in history, and it'd be loaded with stats and numbers and everything else, never had a piece of paper, 
never looked at anything. It was just all total reek. I've never watched anybody operate like that in my life. And it was mind blowing to me because they'd say, Oh, like, do you know him? I'm like, dude, have you seen him before? Like it's, it's insane. And I, I agree with him. It's, it's a big loss for us, but obviously what he's, what he's chosen to move on and do, you can't argue with that. It's, it's such an honorable profession. You know, he's just, but he really was a great voice. And I think that deserves to be recognized. And, and for me to add on to him, you know, I mentioned Susan Waldman earlier and just how inviting she is as a female in this industry. Um, but Bob Rathbun, who's the voice of the Atlanta Hawks, and then Barry McKnight, who's the voice for Troy University, uh, the two of them have probably been my biggest torch bearers through my entire career. Barry took me under his wing while I was a student at Troy, and he's just always been such an inviting individual. He's always offered to give feedback. He's always been constructive and uplifting, and, and we still get to connect with each other and talk, and, and we haven't missed a beat. And for Bob, we actually met because his wife runs a dog rescue group here in Atlanta and we, we adopted a dog through her and my parents told her, Oh, we've got a girl about to graduate college. And she said, Oh, you know, my husband. Um, and, and the first time I sat down with Bob, it was a three hour lunch. And he was the one who had told me, you know, I know that everybody's telling you to be a multi-sport journalist and, and to do this. He said, but you kind of love baseball. And I kind of want to see you stick through to that. And what's been funny with quarantine now that we're all home and obviously he doesn't have the NBA to attend to right now, I've woken up almost every day and he's already sent me three new articles that he's found about what's going on with baseball and, and where we're looking at heading in a new direction. Uh, Cause he was the voice of the Tigers and the Braves for several years. So he, he knows it. he's been there before, but the, the two of them have just, they, they really are family for us. And I think that, that's the best way to end these podcasts is just talking about a champion, somebody that's gone above and beyond, not only to help you guys out, but to help the community and to help a great bevy of folks. All right, look, here's the deal. I got a lot of work to do because Zach just reminded me that I don't have a $500 million contract. So I've got to work on that. So hopefully Bill and all the folks, maybe the ringers listening right now, the great folks at Barstool, maybe somebody's going to pick us up and I can take you guys uh, along the way. Melanie Newman, good luck with the Orioles this year. Hoping and praying that baseball is off to a great start. Can't wait to uh, watch you on Masson. And of course, Frisco as well. Zach Bigley, good luck to you this year. I hope you don't have any of those 130 degree real field days. But I got a feeling that's probably coming, buddy. I appreciate you guys so much. I know it was lengthy, but you guys were great. Hey, thank you so much for having us. I mean, this was this is a blast. It's always fun to kind of recall the, the crazy things about this industry. It's always fun. This has been a nice break for today. It's, it's good to get back into like some type of normalcy for a little bit. So it's, it's a blast. Hey, listen, I learned a lot again. Semi-pro professionals. Thank you guys so much. It's been beer and baseball as always. Take care. Stay safe. For more beer and baseball, subscribe to our podcast and the Myrtle Beach Pelicans YouTube channel. You can also follow the Myrtle Beach Pelicans on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Until next time, cheers.